what gets the first word on your day? What gets the first word on your day? As we've been walking through this series called TechWise, examining the relationship between the lives we're meant to have, the lives we're called to, the things our household are called to be about, wisdom and courage and knowing what's good and knowing what's of God and being able to pursue it, and then talking about how technology can come alongside some of those things and not inherently lead to bad choices, but just kind of dull our senses to what a good choice even is. What gets the first word on your day? Tiana shared last week that it's important for us to consider as well what gets the last word on our day, right? So what we do in those final moments and how we value our bodies with sleep and all kinds of different things, those are important to the kinds of people that God has called us to be. And the truth is, no matter what kind of sleep you've had, the sun is going to come up and a new day will begin. And so I hope you got a tremendous amount of sleep last night and you feel well rested. Chances are some of us do and some of us don't and our days can differ in those ways. But the sun comes up every morning and every morning we rise and we have an opportunity first thing in the morning to give our day to something. Even if it's a lazy day, even if it's a Saturday or a Sabbath day, we have an opportunity to give the first thing in the morning to something. So what gets the first word on your day? Uh, when Alex and I were at our last church in Virginia and we walked through this series and preached it together and all that, it, it was this week, this idea that made the biggest difference in my life four years ago, and it's still making a difference in my life today because without giving it much thought or much intent, a lot of times what gets the first word on my day is my phone. If you use it as an alarm clock, which I still do this, but if you use it as an alarm clock, it's right there within reach, and then it's the first thing you touch, and then you're there with it there in your bed. We've got some stats uh, to show the percentage of Americans that look at their phone first thing right away. 46% of Americans and 66% of young adults use their phones before their feet even hit the floor. Now, uh, last Sunday when Tiana preached in the second service, I was able to go over to the bubble uh, and see our kids' ministry and all that stuff. They had glow sticks. I got a glow stick last week. It was very exciting. And then I went with our youth into the sanctuary up into the loft and listened. To, our youth are walking through a youth version of this series, and they were talking about how long do you think you could go without your phone? And among these uh, teenagers, uh, I, I, in listening to their answers, I could go uh, a little longer without my phone than they said they could, but I'm embarrassed to tell you, it wasn't by much. So there's this common problem where half of us, and among our younger friends, two-thirds of us, we're on this thing before our feet hit the floor. And 71% of Americans are using their phone within 10 minutes of waking up. So like if you get up and go to the potty and then pick up your phone, that's not really much better. What gets the first word on your day? Because if it's this, even not inherently evil or anything like that, but if it's this, consider all the things that we're opening ourselves up to right away. If social media gets the first word on your day, if it's Facebook or Instagram or Twitter or whatever the case may be, we are inviting in all kinds of things that, first of all, we have no control over. You don't know what's happened in the middle of the night. You don't know when you open your social media feed, you don't know what you're going to find there. So right away, if that's the first thing we go to, we're opening ourselves up to what other people posted or how other people said something or that one friend that always posts really annoying, open-ended kinds of things where they're just begging for attention and all kinds of stuff like that, or how many people liked my post or how many people didn't like my post or any of that stuff. If social media gets the first word on our day, not only are we opening ourselves up to an unpredictable set of circumstances, without even trying, we can give comparison and conflict and gossip the first word on our day. 
Or um, if it's just even an affirming, like, oh, I opened social media first thing in the morning and it was really affirming. I posted something and people connected or whatever. That can lead to a temptation that the first word of our day is an inward focus kind of thing that we're tempted to believe that the most important thing in the absolute world is me. We can unintentionally give kind of a self-centered focus uh, on the first thing that happens in our day. And again, for more than half of us or two-thirds of our younger friends, that's where it starts. Uh, sometimes I just want to grab my phone first thing in the morning. Uh, if, uh, like if the Braves are on a West Coast road trip and the game wasn't decided before I went to bed, I want to know when I wake up, did they win? Which I am inviting all kinds of potentially negative emotions, depending on a blown save or whatever, into my life before my feet even hit the floor. What gets the first word on your day? Now, some of you may be sitting out there and saying or thinking some version of like, that's right, these kids today, they don't know nothing with their phones. They shouldn't be doing this first thing in the morning. How dare they, sinners, all that good stuff. And then we think that to ourselves. And the first thing you do in the morning is get up and turn on the news. How's that working out for you? I guarantee you right now, if I pull up, and, and you pick, I can pull up CNN, I can pull up Fox News, I can pull up whatever you want. Um, the odds of the first thing I see being something really uplifting and life-affirming are small. Any source right now, if I pull up, I'm going to read about um, train derailments and murder trials and uh, war. And hear this, uh, we need to hear about those things. News is good. We could have a whole separate sermon series on how to do it better and more healthy and how Christians should uh, consume some of that stuff. We need to know about those things locally and nationally, but I'm not so sure I would make it the very first thing I did in the morning because it invites all kinds of different emotions and all kinds of not just negativity, but things that can come and consume us and consume our lives before we give any of that time to something more intentional, something more life-giving, something more like Jesus. What gets the first word on your day? And how might we structure our lives and ourselves to give that to something a little more fruitful and a little more productive? So while we're thinking uh, about what that looks like and how, that might, uh, how God might have us in mind, uh, I want to give you an example of how I kind of first came to understand this practice and all that, which means um, I would like to talk for a minute about Lane Kiffin. So uh, some of you may be too young. It's weird to say. Some of you may be too young to remember. Lane Kiffin was a football, is a football coach. He was a coach at Tennessee for one year. And then in January of 2010, um, left under the cover of darkness after one year to be the football coach at uh, Southern California, which uh, we were all totally fine with that and acted very responsibly in our behavior in response to it. <laughs> Everyone here was great. Um, when that happened... I lived in Virginia in the middle of nowhere. This is January of 2010, so 13 plus years, it seems strange to say, but 13 plus years ago. And uh, where I lived in Virginia, 40 minutes from a Walmart and all that stuff, I didn't have a smartphone because I had no cell service. So I had a flip phone. I had a flip phone until 2012 when I left that place. But it created this nice little situation for me where um, when I left my house, if I was in that valley, no one could get a hold of me. So Lane Kiffin left on a Tuesday night, and on that Tuesday night, I was teaching a Bible study, blissfully unaware of anything taking place. And I came home from the Bible study at like 9 or 9.30 or something like that, and what I did have was a landline phone and an answering machine. Remember answering machines? And I came in, and I saw the light blinking furiously, and I had like seven messages, and I thought, who died? And... I pushed the button on the answering machine, um, and it was all messages from my friends, and it was just like a constant stream of obscenities. <laughs> and uh, when I realized what had happened, I, at the time, I used to write for a, a larger uh, Tennessee football website. So, like, I, I sat down on my couch and knew, like, when I turn on this TV, 
or when I open this laptop, I am going to go headfirst into a world that I'm not sure how many hours it's going to take me to get out of. Um, and that world is probably not going to be uh, super healthy and uplifting and life-giving. And so this sounds strange to say, but I, I just remember in that moment thinking, I'm going to take a minute before I turn anything on. I'm just going to take a minute and sit here and enjoy the stillness and the silence and any of that before anything else has to happen or take place. And there is, if holiness is taking something and setting it apart, there can be a particular kind of holiness about those spaces that we can create for ourselves, but only if we do it on purpose. Because the truth is, football coaches don't leave in the middle of the night, thankfully, every day. But your life is coming at you, whether you want it to or not. Your life is coming at you every day. And some seasons are really hard and difficult. And some days it's just the minutia of social media and things like that where we can be drawn into comparison and conflict and gossip or just self-centeredness. But I would submit to you that we need some space in there every day before the world comes at us. Even before did the Braves win on the West Coast last night. We are at our best when we create some holiness and some space in there before the news, our news feed, whatever the case may be, comes at us because that stuff is going to come at us every day. Sometimes when, uh, if you've read this book in particular, or if you read the chapter this week, the chapter this week is, is by far the most radical chapter in the book. Um, <clears throat> it's so radical, we're not even preaching on it this morning. Uh, so you're welcome to go and read it and, and uh, listen to him talk about um, uh, practices that are, are um, probably beyond what any of us is, is attempting or anything like that. But sometimes when we come across things like that, we can think to ourselves, well, man, we got to we have to make such significant changes to be the kinds of people God is calling us to be with our technology that it's just impossible. But I think the truth here is, it's not that we're called to go back to the 1950s or 33 AD or the Garden of Eden. The question for us is, how can we take the world as it is now and find one small step or one small space that we can create for ourselves to introduce some holiness and some good practice in there before the rest of the world just comes at us. Uh, by the way, I left all those voicemails on my answering machine for the next two years just because they amused me uh, so much. And when I moved and I knew the church owned that house, and when I moved and the new pastor moved in, I really thought long and hard about just leaving them on the answering machine and letting him discover them. And see, I ended up not doing that, but I thought that would have been a lot of fun. I don't need to go back to 1950, um, but I do think that like 2006 wasn't so bad because in, in 2006, about a year before these came into our lives, there was already built in space. You didn't have to create it for yourself between you and your technology. Unless you were sleeping with your laptop in your bed or you reached for the remote first thing in the morning to turn on your TV. About 15 years ago, there was already built-in space. 15 years ago, I could wake up, go take a shower, come out, get dressed, come out, put coffee on, sit down with that holiness of the first cup of coffee in the morning, and then spend not long, but just a, a minute in prayer or um, I, I still, uh, I'm a big advocate of praying in the shower because it's the, the space you're least likely to be interrupted. But reading something to connect with God. And then all that stuff, 15 years ago, you still had Facebook, it was new, but it was around, and Twitter and all that stuff, and news and sports and jobs and emails and all that stuff was still there, it still existed, but it was tucked away in a laptop that I had to open and type it, couldn't even show them my face back then. I had to type in a password, and then it pulled it up, 
And all that stuff was there when I was ready for it. But that's the key difference with this, is now all that stuff, especially if you use your phone as an alarm clock, you're, you're one push away from all of that. And it is quietly, subtly, so easy to give the very first word of our day directly to that stuff and lead us down a path of comparison and anger and um, being the kinds of people that want to leave a bunch of bad words on an answering machine, that sort of thing. Can we create, one, some distance from this? Because if this gets the first word on your day, almost no matter what you're using it for, if this gets the first word on your day, it's hard for that word to be a good word. It's hard for that word to be a life-giving and uplifting kind of word. So the first step would be creating space. Maybe the holiest thing you can do this week, as Tiana shared some of this last week, maybe the holiest thing you can do this week is go buy an alarm clock and separate out from there if that's an issue. The question would then be, once we've created the space, what do we give that space to? If you're looking for just like ground level early practices of how do we connect with God first thing in the morning. We've shared uh, last fall or early summer on um, prayer. I'm a big advocate of praying in the shower. Like I said, I love praying the Lord's Prayer every morning. It really helps me connect with God. It's a simple thing too. But if we look back at biblical history and see kind of what gets the first word on the day, if you're looking for level one, this is a great level one. This is Deuteronomy 6. In Deuteronomy 6, we have uh, what's called the Shema prayer, Deuteronomy 6 and verse 4. Uh, the Shema prayer is four verses that is enough for us to get it on one slide here. So Moses is communicating to the people and says this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone, or that can also be translated, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. Keep these words that I am commanding you today in your heart. Recite them to your children. Talk about them when you're at home and when you're away, when you lie down and when you rise. You can see what Tiana shared last week, that rhythm of evening and morning. But this prayer, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord alone. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your might. This is a prayer that our Jewish friends were taught then and now to recite in the evening and in the morning. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord alone. Love God with everything you have. So you can see uh, hundreds of years later when they ask Jesus what the most important commandment is, now, Jesus is Jesus. He could say anything he wants, and it, it would be right. But he's not pulling that answer out of thin air. Here's a, this is Mark 12. This is where uh, they asked Jesus that question about what is the most important commandment. This is Mark 12 and verse 28. One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating, and noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he asked him, of all the commandments, which is the most important? The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And the second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. That's also an Old Testament passage from a different section of Scripture. There is no commandment greater than these. Remember, Jesus can be elusive, Jesus, a lot of times when asked direct questions, does not answer or gives some kind of mysterious parable, right? But when they ask him what's most important, he answers directly and ties that answer back all the way to Deuteronomy, back into Israel's history to say, the most important thing is hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord alone. You can hear its connection to um, the Ten Commandments, to have no other gods before this God and all of that. But Jesus also ties it forward to the New Testament to put things together as a consistent ethic that the most important thing is that the Lord is our God 
and that we're called to love this God with everything we have. And that one of the best ways we do that is when we love our neighbor as ourself. So if you're looking for like ground level of how do I create some kind of holiness in the morning? How do I create some kind of intentional space and prayer and connection with God? It's gonna start probably by getting some distance from your smartphone. But if you're looking for just a level one way to connect, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord alone. And then to love God with all we have, and Jesus connects it with to love our neighbor as ourselves. Because I think there's a truth there that the best way that we love God is when we love each other well. Now, um, back when Lane Kiffin left and back in 2006, it was just me in my household. I was single and I had no kids. That made it a little easier to kind of do what I wanted first thing in the morning, right? I did have a community of farmers who thought they were being kind when they waited until 8 a.m. to ring my doorbell. But still, it was just me and those rhythms. And a lot of times now, and if you've got a family, it's this way as well. Sometimes what gets the first word on my day is one of my kids barging in. Sometimes what gets the first word on Alex's day is my alarm going off and me waking up and starting my day. So it's not to say, like, when Covington comes in the room and says, Dad, Dad, and clearly he's awake and excited and full of uncanny five-year-old energy at six in the morning. When he comes in and says, Dad, Dad, I don't look at him and say, hang on, son, I haven't talked to Jesus yet. <laughs> you got to wait, right? Sometimes the first thing that happens to us in the morning is a little beyond our control or outside of the realm of whatever. But one of the best ways we do connect with God is when we connect with each other. If the core truth of this is to love God with everything we have and to love our neighbor as ourselves, then we can do far worse than seeing the people that we love, the people in our household, first thing in the morning. And I don't know about you, some days it may feel like this, but when we say we want to center ourselves around God being one and our call to love each other, that love, I mean, I don't find myself praying a lot in the morning, God, I'm going to try really hard to love my wife and kids today. God, I'm going to try so hard to love you today. That love is not so much about um, white knuckle trying hard and effort. And for me, it's, it's more about centering. Not on the rest of the world and all of the ways that it can come in. Not even on the things that we need to know, like the news. It's more about centering on something that's bigger than me. Because even before there were smartphones or TVs or any of that stuff, the single greatest temptation that human beings face is a belief that this world is primarily about us. The single greatest and oldest temptation that human beings face is a belief that what goes in the center is me and not Jesus. And so starting even with just a breath or two to remind myself, to remind ourselves that here, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord alone, the Lord is one. God, open my eyes to how I can love you today. Open my eyes to how I can love my family today. Let love slip in there and get the first word, even if it's just one or two breaths. But if we don't create the space, then sometimes that doesn't get the first word on our day. It gets the fifth or sixth word on our day, and our day is already off on another path. So what's it look like for you first thing in the morning? We want to pray in just a moment, but the real rubber meets the road of this is tomorrow morning. We've been excited already. Our, our church in walking through this series has been inviting people to create one consistent, meaningful, screen-free hour every day during Lent. Lent is now four days old. 
And so even in just four days, we've been excited to hear about the different ways you and your family have gone through and struggled with this. I don't know about you, um, I, a lot of it is the reflex for me. My family takes 4 to 5 p.m. screen-free, and even still, I'll think, I'll find myself doing this, and it's not, my phone's not in there anymore. It's on the charger. Or I'll think to myself, I'd like to take a picture of that, but I have to wait 30 more minutes, and then I can take a picture of that. And so as we walk through this together, Sometimes it's just the small but significant steps that we can take along the way. And I promise you, it's been true for me. One of the smallest but most significant things that you can do is ask yourself, what am I giving the first word of my day to? And if it's something that tempts us to put ourselves in the center or can put us in all kinds of different mindsets, we would invite you to consider how we might recenter our lives, not around ourselves, but recenter our lives around the one who made us, who invites us to create some space, and who reminds us that the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And the best way we can connect with this God who loves us is to love him. And the best way we do that is by loving each other.